has been possibly definitely so they will try. But those that are here, would you stand? The whole one try. Open the Bible to the Old 
Old Testament to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings 17 chapter and we're only going to get a portion of that chapter, the first seven verses and then the 24th verse that ends that chapter. 1 Kings chapter 17 beginning at verse 1 and concluding at verse 7 and then going on down to the end of the chapter which is the 24th verse. Let us say right. Those who can stand, when you stand, I will stand, but my standing is not in life. Amen. But if you can, and if there's a power in your area, then I'm sure that person will remind you walk over there uh, and share it with me. Our first Kings 17 chapter begins by saying, and Elijah, the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, except in my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him under my Elijah, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook, kill it which flows into the jar. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, but he went and stayed by the brook Kilos, which flows into the jar. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And let's come over to verse 24, which ends the chapter. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God. And that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. So in the communion of God, precious and holy word, we receive. I want to share some thoughts out of my own personal faith struggle and observations. And I want to talk about dry brooks this morning. Dry brooks. I was reading the article. Not too long ago, and they talked about a young man by the name of Julian McCoy. I don't know her, and I'm sure you don't know her. Not that I would allow him to be on this side of the journey, but this young man thought he said that he was going to Bowie State University. And one weekend, when he left Bowie State, he went to pick up his girlfriend, but Julian never did arrive at the site to get his girlfriend. And day by day passes, his parents, uh, they feared the worst, but they hoped for the best. After 10 days, one day a lady was driving down the road. And she, as she was crossing over a bridge, something caught her attention. She happened to look down, and there was a car underneath the bridge that had flipped over, and it was lying in a drying up creek bed. So she called the authorities, and they came. And miraculously, Julia McCormick was still alive after 10 days with the car upside down. And they asked him how he survived. 
And he told them that even though the creek bed was drying up and it just trickled the water, that some water got in his shoe and he drank water out of his shoe. And then there was a fish that got caught in a little pond of water. So he ate the fish. He was rescued. But the authority said that it was a miracle because if the creek had kept its normal level of water, Julian would have dried. In 1 Kings, the 17th chapter, we are introduced to a prophet of God. His name is Elijah. And Elijah, there is no forewarning of Elijah before his name appears on the pages of the Holy Ring. We see Elijah walking into the court of Ahab the king. He's not announced. We don't know anything about him. We don't know in terms of about his background, his family, nothing like that. And in a brash and a very seemingly arrogant way, Elijah walks up to King Ahab and says to him, Oh King Ahab, I just come to tell you one thing. That it's not going to rain for three and a half years. And then after he made that announcement, he twirled around and walked out of the palace of Ahab, just like he walked in. We're told that God told Elijah, I will to a brook called Kirith. Now, in the reading, the rendering of the Bible is spelled C H E. You would think it would be an announcement. Now it's either Sheriff or Sheriff. But the accurate pronunciation <laughs> is Kirith in the Hebrew. And God tells. Elijah, I want you to go to this brook, stay there, and I'm going to command my ravens to bring to you in the morning bread and meat. I'm going to command them to bring to you in the evening bread and and then you got the water of the brook that you can drink from. Elijah for a year ate the food that the birds brought. And incidentally, if you know anything about the nature of a raven, I mean you all know the nature of a raven. Ravens don't give food to nobody. Ravens are scavengers and they eat whatever they can find and they even fight other birds their size to get maybe carry on or something like that. So in itself we see the sovereignty of God changing the nature of the bird that he made and instead of eating the food, the birds bring food to God's prophet. Elijah is by the brook Kirith for about a year. And all of a sudden, well really not all of a sudden, the, the brook dries up. And that's natural because Ahab, I mean Elijah, has just told King Ahab that there would be no rain for three and a half years. And by the way, 
in the uh, rendering here of the text, it says three years. But if you go over to James, the fifth chapter, and I think in the 14th verse, James corroborates what Elijah said. James said, for a span of about three and a half years. When the brook dries up, Elijah has no water there. The crops are not water. All of the crops are burned up. There's no food. Automatically, this is going to what? Contribute to a drought, a famine. And people are starving and dying. But God always takes care of him. And that brook was Elijah's hope of survival. While the rest of the land, people were dying and food was scarce. But now, Elijah has no more water. He is like the other people that he too now must try to find a way to survive. Normally, if this happened to an average person, they possibly would be asking God now, why would you send me here to this brook? And you knew after a year that the uh, brook would go dry. And I possibly am in danger of dying and not surviving myself. Elijah could have given up. He could have said, well, this is the end. And I did what God told me to do. Therefore, I thank God that he used me. But the narrative at this point, you can't panic. You can't give up on your life. You can't do that. Because you see, even though the group dried up, but you have to look at dry roots through the perspective of God who made the brook. Amen? And when you look at the dry brook through the perspective of what God can do, God always brings a fruitful production out of that which is nothing. So I want to suggest that there are three things that God did and why he dried up the brook. And in terms of why, not only for Elijah, but you know what? God is still drying up roots in our lives, too. And if you don't understand what a dry fruit is, then I will explain it to you as we go along. The first thing that comes out of this drama this truth is that a dry brook proves God's obedience if you listen to God. Dry brooks prove the obedience of those that listen to God. Elijah could have stayed by that brook, no water. He could have disobeyed God. He could have died by the brook. But when you come to verse 4, God tells Elijah, get up from the brook and go to Zerubbath, and there you will find a widow woman that will give you something to eat. Now, before we get to that, let me say that being at Can you hear me now? Let the load of speed get it out and go out and in. Dry brooks represent not only the spirituality in everybody's life, but dry brooks can represent a lot of things. If Elijah had stayed there, he would have missed his blessing. Because 
even though God at the beginning told, it, told him to go there. Now, that's another insight. God did not tell Elijah to go to any brook. He told him to go to the brook, Kirov. And there was the only brook where Elijah was going to get food and get refreshed. He could have gone to another brook, but God didn't tell him to go to another brook. He told him to go there. And that points up this fact. Many times in your life and my life, when we are disobedient and God tells us to go to, and do a certain thing or go to a certain place, you better do it. Because God can bless you when you do it your way. You've got to do it God's way. And it doesn't matter in terms of whether, in terms of human logic or rationale, it doesn't make sense. God is supposed to make sense. Amen. God is supposed to, how can I say, He's not supposed to so order life that you can figure it out and you know what He's going to do before He does it. We are to what? Trust God and obey. You know, there's a song that says, Trust and obey, for there is no other way. So Elijah is told to go there, but now he's told to go to Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel is where the blessing of God is. Now, there's a question that comes out of this. Are you in the place where God wants you to be in your life? Let me repeat that. Are you spiritually? Are you physically? Are you in the place? Are you in the position where God wants you to be? If you are uncertain, then you better go to him and let this pray. Because if you're not where God wants you to be, God can't bless you where you're not supposed to be. Amen. He blesses us according to his will, not according to our design. Can't you imagine Lot and Lot, who was Abraham's nephew, and you remember he went to Sodom and Gomorrah, he went down on the flat low plain. Lot prospered when he went to Sodom. He had a lot of wealth. But the problem was Lot had no influence in Sodom and Gomorrah, which meant that that was not where God wanted him to be. Look at Samson. Samson, he enjoys himself with the lot, huh? and he has a lot of pleasure, but he has no strength. And whenever you are not where God wants you to be, there is what? No strength. Then, let's give another example. Look at Peter. Remember when Jesus was being careful from one courtroom to another, and Peter came out in the courtyard to warm himself by the fire? Peter got warm, but Peter had no courage. So, Peter had no business being by that campfire. Samson had no business being with the lie. Lot had no business being in Sodom. Now, only you and I know whether we're in the right place at the right time. Amen? I can't tell you because I have to pray and I have to seek God's will and guidance in my own life. I don't know what his plans are for your life. But if you don't do it his way, there are dire consequences in not opening God. The second, the second truth that comes out of this is that a brook runs dry in order to purify our observation or to make our focus clearer as we're looking at life. Elijah was having a good time by the brook when the water was there. The birds were his friends. He had food to eat, he had nourishment, and he had water to drink. But 
But you see, God didn't want Elijah to stay there because if you stay in a place where God doesn't want you to be and he tells you to move to another place, then the ravens that he sent to Elijah that at first were a blessing to Elijah, if he had not left and gone to Zerubbabel, those same ravens would have become a burden to Elijah. Amen. When God, when, 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 when I obey God, and I do what God wants me to do, and I go where He wants me to go, sometimes, maybe many times, the way is going to be quite turbulent. Uh, it's going to look as though that things are not going right. But haven't you, haven't you experienced in your own life that when you do it God's way, no matter how rough and rugged the way is, God always has a way of making the rough, smooth, the crooked, straight. He has a way of giving you victory in spite of what the enemy tries to do in terms of blocking your way. Ever you notice that? Or, let me say it another way, how many of you that God has done that in your life? Raise your hand. I know he's done that in my life. There are many times that I didn't question God and I may have said, Lord, why? This don't make sense. This is going to be in the wrong direction. In fact, if we need another witness, let's go to Brother Jonah. You remember Brother Jonah, Brother Jonah? The Lord told him to go where? To Nineveh. But Jonah said, No, I'm not going where you want me to go. I'm going where I want to be. So he started out towards what? Tosh. But let me tell you something I found out personally. When God wants you to be somewhere, and He wants you really to be somewhere, you better be that somewhere because He has the power to make you be there somewhere. And even though Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, that didn't matter because God had prayed for Jonah. And you know what happened. Through the story, but what God brought what a storm, and when God got through with Jonah, Jonah was glad to go to Nineveh. When that fish got through, what built in my own land? Now, I'm sure that Jonah said, "Lord, thank you. I know I was stumbling all the end, but you've given me another chance, so I'm going to do what you want me to do." Brooks clarify our faith. Somebody said, don't let the bucket make you forget the fountain. Sometimes we can get caught up in the blessing of the brook and forget about the one who gave you the brook and the blessings at the brook. Let me say it another way. Let me turn it around. Never forget God the giver because the blessings are temporary. Blessings come and go. But if you connect with the giver of the blessing, even though the blessing might vanish, but God can always give you a blessing. That's the problem. He specializes in blessings. But I would much rather have God and not the blessing at that moment than to take the blessing, lose God, and then have the blessing what? To evaporate on me or to fall apart or what? A deteriorate. That's the purpose of life. God has no problem giving us talk. Giving you and me a toy. Actually, a blessing is nothing but a toy anyway. It's just like when you give kids toys at Christmas time. And what happens to them? After they play with it for a while, they get tired of it. What do they do? They shove it off and they go right back in the closet what, and get the old toy that they got the Christmas before. Appreciate the blessing. Hold on to the blessing. 
song. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Well, you ain't saying nothing. You just look at me like you're in me. And I know you can speak. Thank God for the blessing a toy, but never turn a loose a blessed saw the killer of the toy. Because you never know when he's got a blessing that's bigger and better than the one you already had. Friend, I was telling you the other day, and you saying that the car that God had given him, that he was about to break down and it was costing a lot of money to get it fixed. And he said that he had a way of getting a newer car. But it was going to cost him more. So I asked him, I said, if you prayed about this, because everything that I see, it may not be that God wants me to have that. And you see, man can maneuver and manipulate a lot of things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this is God. 